Could you spell your first and last name, please? M-A-R-I-E. Last name is H-A-L-L. Right, raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Please walk right around here and have a seat. You may proceed. May I have your name, please? Marie Hall. And drawing your attention back to June of 2008, did you happen to know an individual by the name of Travis Alexander? Yes, I did. And how did you meet him? I met him through a church. Um, what church was that? Um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Is that a singles ward? Are they also known as Mormons? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been in practice of Mormon? My whole life. And how was it that you met him? You said you met him through church, but explain to me how it was that you met him. I gave a talk in, in the church service on a Sunday, and uh, he came up to me afterward and uh, commented on how well I did. When was that approximately? Approximately January or February of 2008. And after he had that conversation with you, did you continue to see him? Yes. Uh, how often would you see him? He asked me out a couple of times. Um, I think we went on three dates. And I, I, I know that, but I mean, would you? did he ask you out immediately, or did he, that first time that he met you then, or how did that no. progress? Um, I would see him every Sunday at church, and then we had weekly activities. And so he probably asked me out a couple of weeks after he commented on my talk. These activities that you're talking about with the church, what were they? Um, they were church single adult activities, so we would either, um, well, there was a family home evening, so every Monday we would meet uh, for a spiritual thought and just a socializing time, and then we would have service activities or just fun activities. Let me ask you about the singles activities. Mm -hmm. You said that were those on any given date, or was that any time, or how did those work? Um, the activities are were usually weekly um the most consistent ones that we would have would be monday night for a family home evening we called it that's also known as fhe correct yes mm -hmm. and the family home evening what time does that start um 7 seven thirty. and what time does it normally end about eight thirty. um about what time eight thirty. And during this time of family home evening, it implies that, by the word family, that your whole family is there. I thought that you told me or said something about singles ward or something. Are they the same thing, or is this something different, or what's going on? So, um, growing up in a family, uh, the church set you know set aside a time for families to meet, every, you know, to have a little um, gathering at home um, where they share a spiritual thought. But in the singles ward. Um, they just have, you know, there's obviously no families in the singles ward. It's just single adults from the age of 18 to 31. They will meet um, every Monday as if they were a big family. And so, then, as I understand it, what you're saying, though, it, even though you're calling it a family home evening, what you're telling me is if you're in the singles ward, it's just a bunch of singles. Yeah, it's a meet and greet type of thing. And what was the uh, ages involved here? 18 to 31. And what happens to a single who hasn't married after the age of 31? They go to a family ward. Um, typically, typically you, they go to a family ward. So, um, like me, I'm 33, I'm in a family ward now. What does that mean? Um, well, people who are married, people who are single, um, you know, just everyone goes to the same ward. If you're a single adult over 31, you would go to a family ward now, unless you have an older single ward in your area of well, where you live. What do the activities that are in the single wards, do they differ from the family ward post-31? Um, yes. How so? Um, well, you're not going out, uh, you, you know, um, the, the, the family ward doesn't meet together every Monday night for family home meeting. That's just done individually on a family by family basis. Um, sometimes you'll have big activities with the ward where you might go to a lake and have a barbecue, but usually that's done with single adults. 
Um, and then both a single adult ward and a family ward will do service projects. Well, let me ask you about the single ward activity. In describing it, it just seems to me that that's more of a social kind of um, approach to things with religion mixed in. Would that be fair or not? Yeah, that's fair. And what kind of social activities does this, those in the single ward, what do they engage in? Um, okay. uh, we, we would go to, um, maybe we would go ice skating all together or we would um, go to a lake or have a barbecue or we would go to someone's house and, um, and typically there's a spiritual thought, maybe a scripture read and someone's um, personal experience with that. And that's usually like 10 minutes and then we we'll just have fun. And, and for a singles ward, it's an area for people to meet each other, get to know each other, possibly make a, a connection where they start dating and eventually get married. These singles wards that we're talking about, is there one singles ward for all of Mesa, a singles ward for Tempe, or um, how do, what are the geographical lines, if you will, for a singles ward? Um, yeah, so they're broken up geographically, usually um, for convenience sake, you know, so that you have one close in your neighborhood that you can go to. Um, I don't know, like, how they determine uh, the boundaries as far as what the distance is, but they're usually pretty small, um, and in this, in at least in Mesa, Gilbert area, um, there are several uh, single adults. They have um, even single adult stakes, so... Let me ask you about the single ward that you were in back in 2008. Did that have like a name or a geographical name? Yeah. What was the, it called? Hold on. Let me, I have to ask okay. a question. You can't take both of us. What, what was that? Um, the name of our ward was Desert Ridge Ward at the time, and then it was yeah, changed to Indigo Bay. But, but it was Desert Ridge back then, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes, yes that's correct. Okay. Yes. And with regard to that, Ward that you were in. How many people would you? How many singles would you say was in there? Um, several hundred. How many? Several hundred. And would they all meet at the same time on Mondays for the family home evenings, or is it something that? Um. Different? Yeah. Sometimes we would meet in smaller groups, but but for the most part, we would all meet together. Not everyone would show up every Monday. So you're looking at a group of maybe fifty to a hundred people showing up every Monday. And. Would there be a situation where people from a your single board, the Desert Bridge, would they, for example, uh, associate with members from another single board? Uh, yeah, you could do that. Were you familiar with the university uh, single board or not? Yes. And how far away, geographically speaking, was the one the university from yours? Um. You mean mile wise or like yeah, just time? Yeah, sure. It, it would um, probably 10 miles, five, five to 10 miles away. Five, 10 miles away? Yeah. The, and as to which ward you belong, is that determined by a place of residence or is that a choice that is made by the person who's going to be in the single ward? It's set up to be uh, by a place of residence. So you, if you live, Travis and I lived in this, the same neighborhood. And so we went to the same singles ward. You, you mentioned that he complimented some sort of presentation that you made. Was that presentation made as part of the singles ward family home evening, or was that made as part of some, your presentation as something else? That was, um, he commented on a talk that he gave during our sacrament meeting, which is on Sunday. We, so, that, so that's not the same as the singles ward meeting and all that stuff, right? That's church, right? Right, that's church. And that was on a Sunday. Right? That was on a Sunday, yes. And he came up to you after one of those talks, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And after that is when he asked you sometime after that, right? Yeah. And was it at this singles meetings that he asked you, or how did that come about? Uh, if you remember. I, I, I don't remember if he called me or if he asked me at one of the meetings. I don't remember. And uh, did you agree to go out with him? Yes. And um, describe for me the day. Did he come to your house? Did he take you somewhere? Why don't you just tell me a little bit about the day? Um, 
I mean, we went to dinner and we went to Barnes and Noble, a bookstore, and had some hot chocolate. And about what time did the date start? Um, probably about seven thirty. And about what time did it end? Um, about ten thirty. So it's a total of three hours, right? Uh, yeah. And during that time, um, did you uh, develop any feelings for him? Were there any sparks there? Was tell me about how you felt during this day. I thought he was a really nice guy, but I didn't have any sparks. And did you let him know about that? Um, I just by the, the first date. No, yes, the first date. No, That's what we're talking about. I just kind of you know just by the way you act with someone when you're not quite as interested in them. So. And, and during that date, did Mr. Alexander say anything sexually uh, inappropriate to you at all? No. At any time during that date, did he kiss you? No. Did he try to kiss you when he dropped you off? No. And at any time, did he reach out, hold your hand, or do anything like that? No. At the most, he, made, he gave me a hug, good night, like an awkward um, hug. Uh, how did you leave the day? Did you guys agree that you were going to go out again, or what happened? Uh, I, just typical, where you know I had a great time. Thank you very much. We should go out sometime. Okay, sure. You know that that kind of thing. But shortly after, I started. But, but you didn't really want to go out, though, right? No. Okay. After that, did you start seeing somebody else? Yes. And and <laughs> about when was that that you started to see this other individual? Um, within a matter of like a week or two, I started, it was kind of, I had gone out with probably the other individual once before, and so we started going out more often. Okay. And was this person also in the singles ward or no? Um, he was in a singles ward, but not in our singles ward. I knew, right. I met him through another friend. But he was also more of a friend. Yes, that's correct. How long did you continue to see this other individual? Just a couple of weeks. So after a couple of weeks, you and this other individual broke up again, I guess, or stopped seeing each other, right? That's correct. And after that, as it applies to Mr. Alexander, did you approach him or did he approach you? He approached me. And any idea of the date, more or less, what it was? I would uh, say it was in mid-February, March, maybe. And during that time, that he approached you, whether it's mid-February or mid-March, what happened? Did he ask you out or what happened? Tell me what happened. Yes, he asked me out and we went on another date. Uh, we went in... Uh, Did, do you know whether or not he knew about this other individual that you'd gone out with? I had to, I think he, yeah, he, I had told him, um, because he had asked me out before, I told him that I, I had started dating someone else. Okay. And so, you know, he backed off. And then when I broke up, he, I, he found out, I'm assuming, and started, you know, trying to ask me out again. So, during the, when you told him that you were seeing this other individual, was he upset? Did he start raising his voice and curse or anything like that? No, no. What was his reaction when you said, you know, I'm seeing somebody else? He was very sweet and respectful and totally understood. Did you and him ever text each other? Yes. How about emails? Did you exchange those? Yes. Um, after you told him that you were going to see this other individual, did he send you um, in, uh, text messages calling you, I don't know, disparaging names, bad names? No. no. Um, but did he continue to text with you? Yes. How about emails? Did you and he continue to correspond through email? Yes. And did he ever send you any emails calling you names or accusing you of things? Not at all. So he reapproaches you again after you're done with this relationship, and you say that could be February or March of 2008. Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. And where do you go on this date? We went to a place where you paint pottery, um, and we both, well, I made a bowl. All right, and um, what town was this in? Mesa. What time did he pick you up? 7.30, typical time probably. And how long were you out with Just a couple of hours, probably three hours. And what happened after you, the two of you were done painting this pottery? He took me home. And during the time that you were with him that day, did he ever curse at all? No. During that time, did he make any sexual advances, whether they were wanted or unwanted? 
No, I felt very safe with Travis. He was, you know, very respectful. I had, there was never anything like that. At any time, did he curse at you or you see that show any temper during that time? No. And at the end of the day, did you and he and again engage in what may be customary kind of uh, touching, kissing, that sort of thing? No, and again, it would just be an awkward hug good night. That was, that was the extent of anything. And during that time, did you ever indicate to him that maybe the sparks weren't there for you? Um, not on the date, no. No. And at any time after that, did you tell him that? Or did you continue going out? Um, we went out one other time. All and right. then at that point, you know, I... I was trying, he was a really fun guy, I was trying to get to know him and I didn't want to write him off too soon, so, um, but at, after the third date, you know, I, I let him know that I just wanted to be friends. The third date, what was that that you went on the third date? Um, it would have, it would have been in March, um, and we went uh, rock climbing. And where was this place that you went rock climbing? The, the Phoenix Rock Gym in Tempe. And was this also starting at 7.30 or did this start at a different time? I don't recall exactly, but I would assume it would have been early evening, 7, 7. And know about what, how much time you spent with him? Um, again, just a couple of hours, just, you know. And again, at any time during this day, did he make any sexual advances towards you? No. Um, did he attempt to kiss you as the date was done? No. Did he attempt to kiss you when he first saw you? No. Did he attempt to kiss you not on the lips, but like the forehead or something? No. During this date, is that when you, after this date or during this date, is that when you let him know that perhaps he's not for you? After the date, yes. I like how, how did you do that? Um, I don't remember if it was um, through a phone or in person, but I let him know that, you know, I just wanted to be friends. But it was verbal enough. It words. was verbal, yes. Okay. And um, is that what you said, I just want to be friends, or did you say anything else? Um, I just, yeah, I, I don't remember exactly what I said. Or what was his reaction to you telling her? He understood, and um, he, he actually thanked me for telling him. Uh, he actually what? Thanked me for telling him directly, you know, so that he knew where he stood. And um, I mean, he was respectful about the whole thing, so. Did he ever tell you why he, he thought you and he would make a good match or anything like that or no? No. So, after that, did you continue to stay in contact with him or not? Yes, we um, continued on being friends. And uh, How did that manifest itself? How did you keep in touch with him? We would continue to see each other at church. Um, I started a book and film club. A and, what? A book and film club. Okay. So um, our first meeting we had at his house. He had a movie projector and um, it was, you know, a fun, fun friendship and yeah. And at any time during this friendship as it went along, <laughs> Did he ever, um, I don't know, berate you in any way? No, I'm not sure what berate means. Okay. Did he at any time scream at you, that sort of thing? No. Um, where, where do you work at now? I work for J.P. Morgan Chase. And have you attended college? Yes. Where did you graduate from? Brigham Young University. Where? Brigham Young, BYU. All right. And with regard to the Mormon faith, what is their belief with regard to sexual content before marriage? It's a, um, it's a very serious sin and um, one that you could lose your good standing in church for. You could even become uh, excommunicated for it. What does excommunicated mean? Um, in the church, you know, a, good, a member in good standing holds callings where they, you know, do service for other ward members, other people. Um, they attend the temple. Okay. Um, being excommunicated means that you lose your privileges to be able to do those, and you lose your member records. Um, you're no longer a member of the church. To become a member again, you would have to repent, go through a process, be rebaptized. These rules that you've been describing to me, do they apply differently 
or they apply differently to somebody who has joined the church later in life as opposed to somebody like you who has always been in the church. Objection foundation is the expert testimony. Offer roll, give me answer if you know. Okay. Um, do, so if I understand you, they, do they apply differently depending on how long you've been in the church? Right, whether or not you've converted later on or not. No, they apply the same to every person. So in this purpose, this issue of excommunication, what is that? What, what is that? Excommunication? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's where you lose your, um, basically your names are taken off the records of the church. You're no longer a member of the church. So um, you can still come to church, um, but in order to be, become a member again, you have to go through a repentance process. Stop doing what you're doing. Um, you know, repent between you and the Lord. And there's different steps that you have to go through that. Um, and then, in order to be, in order to come back to the church, you need to be rebaptized to the church. This repentance process, and again, in your knowledge, does it mean that, for example, you can engage in sexual intercourse today? Go repent tomorrow. Engage in sexual intercourse tomorrow. Repent tomorrow. And Keep doing that? Is that what this is what we're talking about? Or is it something different than that? No, I mean, uh, you would have to give up that sin completely. It's something you would have to change in yourself. Um, you can't, uh, it, you, no, you would not be able to do that. So, for example, if the defendant were engaged in sexual intercourse and it was outside of marriage, would she potentially face this excommunication if she were to the church? Objection and cause for speculation in that expert testimony. Sustained is raised. Ma'am, you're familiar with the process, aren't you? Yes. Does it apply to everybody? It does. And how long have you been schooled in the practices as to what leads to excommunication? Um, ever since you know we were taught as children the things right and wrong. The commandments of God, you know, we're taught to obey, and we, we know, and, and I was born in the church, so I mean, since I was a child, I've been taught these things. So if an individual, for example, is a female and engages in sexual intercourse, are they subject to the same sanction, i.e. excommunication? Yes. So gender has nothing to do with whether or not there's going to be a punishment for this, right? That's correct. So it isn't, so if two people in, engage in this act of sexual intercourse, they're in there independently, right? Right. The issue of repenting, how do they repent? How does somebody repent in the Mormon church? I mean, you may have mentioned something about a bishop. Explain to me what we're talking about there. Okay. Um, you know, uh, to repent of a sin, uh, you need to take certain steps. Confession, um, you need to stop doing it. Um, you need to uh, usually sac sacrifice or give something up. So um, every Sunday, we, if you're in good standing, you can partake of the sacrament. Um, and so uh, you yourself wouldn't want to uh, decide, like an individual can't decide exactly what steps they have to go through. It's um, they have to go to a bishop which is the church, uh, the, the leader of the congregation of each ward, it's a congregation. Um, they have to go to the bishop, confess their sin. Um, the bishop is, you know, uh, a volunteer, you know, someone who's called, um, of, of, we believe of, he's called of God and is, has inspiration from God to help them work through their repentance process. So if they need, if they have an addiction or, you know, they need help and they need to seek professional um, counseling or something, they will help them get into that. Um, but it's a very, um, what's the word? It's very private that, you know, the bishop does not talk about what they've done with anyone else. It's very, um, yeah. So that's who the bishop All is. right. Now, so you then have this third day with Mr. Alexander. After that, you, you indicated that you continued to communicate with him, right? Yeah. And what was the methods that you guys communicated? Um, the phone? Method. Yeah, um, just, just like friends, like through phone, text. I would hear from him almost every day through a phone call, a text, I would, or see him, or an email. Um, he was very interested in becoming good friends, and so he was 
working on that and, and I had a good time with him and I was having fun so you know it wasn't um, anything. Did said. there come a time that he asked you to go somewhere? Yes. Mm -hmm. And where is it that he asked you to go? Um, he asked me to go to Cancun with him. He won a trip. Uh, All right. When you say you won a trip, who did he win the trip with? Through his work. You know who he worked for? I don't. Mm -mm. So he wins this trip and he asks you to go with him. When did he ask you to go with him? Um, in May, some at uh, some time in May. Uh, 2008. Uh, yes, 2008. <clears throat> but you've told me now or before that he really didn't like him. There weren't any sparks there. <clears throat> did you agree to go with him? Yes. Immediately when he asked you or not? Well, when he first asked me, I told him I wanted to think about it. Um, uh, I was concerned. Um, just because I knew he did like me a little bit more than I liked him, you know, I, I was just friends. But also, um, he let me know that we would be staying with the family, an LDS family, and I would be sharing a room with one of their daughters, a little girl. Um, and it was at a place where I had been to several times before. So I felt comfortable. I knew Travis, and I knew myself. I knew nothing, you know, would happened plus he told me that it was free everything was free so at, after I thought about it for a while I agreed to go because it sounded like a lot of fun so how much time elapsed between the time that he asked you and the time that you said yeah I'll go with you um probably just a couple of days and generally do you have any idea when that would have been I know you said may but <clears throat> you refine it a little bit more or not? beginning of may I don't know exactly what day and um, did you then continue having more or less contact with him or just continue having contact as before where he would either call you or you'd see him? Yeah, so. I mean, we would see each other at church. We went on a church camp out for the singles work. We went on a camp out. Where did you go for this camp out? Uh, it, it was up near Payson. And did uh, Travis go? Yeah. And uh, do you know if he went with anybody or just a bunch of singles? Just a bunch of singles. Was we that in May? Separate cars. Uh, yeah. And um, I've got to ask, I guess, about the sleeping arrangements. Did everybody sleep in the <laughs> Girls and guys were separated. Yeah, so girls had cabins. Um, guys slept outside, either in tents or there was a platform where they could. And during that time, how long were you in Mr. Alexander's presence? In other words, that he was around you. During the camp out? Yeah, how long was the camp out, I guess? Uh, that was just a, like a night and a day. So like a Friday night, and we hung out Saturday, drove home Saturday. And was there ever any indication that Mr. Alexander was involved with any of the women there, chasing them around, or anything like that? No. Uh, there were any indication that he was saying anything inappropriate to any women there? No. Um, so the, the time for the trip approaches, correct? Yes. And did you continue to have contact with him? Uh, yes, um, up until about a week before we found him, uh, I spoke to and him. And do you have an idea about the date that you actually, about the last time that you talked to him? It would have been, so So we found him on June 9th, the evening of June 9th, and uh, I, I remember seeing him last, the Monday before that, which would have been the 2nd. Okay, June 2nd. so a week before you saw him, and after that, did he continue to email you or not, or did he just go silent? He just went silent. So the trip is approaching, and you're not hearing from him. Uh, do you do something on July 9th? June 9th. I'm sorry, June 9th, correct. Yeah, so um, I went to um, our family home evening group, it was normal. Is this a singles group again? Yes. Okay, um, and what, about what time did that start? 7.30. And how long did it last? Um, about till 8.30. And then what did you do? Uh, a friend of mine had just had surgery, so I uh, went to visit with her. Um, in the meantime, I had tried calling and texting him because I didn't see him at church on Sunday. We were supposed to go on this trip the next day, and I hadn't heard from him, so I texted him. He didn't respond, and then he wasn't at, at the family home evening group. So I started to become worried um, and decided after I visited my friend that I would go to his house. Okay, and did you go to his house? Yes, on the way to his house I started getting really worried because I called and I went straight to voicemail. Um, I called and had my mom on the other line just because um, 
I was I was scared that something might be happening to him because I knew that he had a stalker. So, at least you you had heard he had a stalker, correct? Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. yes. And so you were afraid when you went over there, and that's why you had your mom on the line. Yeah, I had suspicions that something right. was going on. So you had suspicions. So what happened? About what time did you get over there? Um, this would probably be right around nine, nine thirty. All right, and explain to me what happens when you get there. Um, I pulled up, and there was a car in the driveway. I didn't know whose car it was. There was a light on upstairs, um, and I went to the door and knocked on it. Um, nobody answered. The dog jumped up on the door and looked. Do you know the dog's name? Um, Napoleon. And what's the color of the dog? The color? Yeah. Um, white and black. All right. Is it a bigger or smaller dog? It's just a tiny little dog. All right. And so this, this dog is there. Explain to me what the dog's doing with the dog. He uh, looked really upset, and he was jumping at the door and barking. And uh, how long were you there trying to get into the house? Um, just, you know, a couple of minutes. I banged on the door, ring the doorbell over and over again. Nobody answered. So my, um, my mom and my sister were on the other line with me, and my sister suggested I call uh, somebody that Travis knew to see if they had seen him around. And who's this person that was suggested to you? Um, well, um, just she just suggested I call a friend. So I called uh, oh. Michelle Lowry, a friend of Travis's, a mutual friend of ours. All right, so you call Michelle, and do you and she agree on how to proceed? What did uh, you do? Yeah, so um, she decided to call Travis's uh, her best friend, which was her ex-boyfriend. Um, and I ran home, because I lived really close by, to see if he had emailed me or Facebook messaged me. Um, and had he? No, he had not. What did you do? I tried to send him a message. I later found out that it went to the wrong Travis, but I tried to send him a message on that. And uh, so you went home, you did that, and then what happened? Okay, and so then um, at that point, uh, Michelle and I went and met at his house again. Uh, Michelle brought her boyfriend, and um, and she was on the other line with Travis's best friend, and he and so her her boyfriend went and knocked on the door again, rang the doorbell. I mean, he was pounding on the door. And when this was going on, what was the dog doing? Uh, barking at the door. All right. So, and how long did this go on? This pounding, this banging. A minute or two. Um, were you able to see from the outside whether or not any lights were on inside? It, it was the same as when I had um, we drove up the first time, so there was a light on upstairs. That same car was in the driveway. All right. Then what happened? Um, so his friend, uh, the, the uh, Travis's friend on the phone, um, suggested that we go in through the garage and look for him in the house. And he had the garage code. So, he so the person it. on the phone that... Mm -hmm. That who was talking to him? Michelle was talking to him. That Michelle was talking to had the garage access code. Yes. And that was given to Michelle. Yes. So what happens then? We open the garage and um, uh, his car and bike bike were there. What kind of car? A Prius. Then what happens? I'm sorry. So we went into the house. Okay. And through through the garage door. And what is the first room that you came to? Um the the laundry room. There is a washer and dryer right. To our right. Did any of you look at those at all? At the and just just noticed that it was a washer and dryer. So that means you're walking in straight, so to speak, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And then where did you go? Left or right? Left. What happened then? Um, his office was so after we turned left, his office was up to, on the right hand side, and the door was shut. And the um, friend on the other line uh, suggested that we open the door. So we opened the door slowly. Um, the light was out, but his laptop was on his desk. It was open, um, but like in a sleep mode, the little light on it was flashing. 
Okay. What happened then? Um, um, there was a bathroom on the left side, and I looked inside the bathroom and checked inside the shower to make sure no one was hiding in the shower. And did you find anything? No. Where did you guys go after that? Um, we went straight, uh, which led us into a like family area. There's a family room area, a kitchen, and um, there was a vacuum cleaner right in the middle of the floor. Any, and do you, did you see whether or not it was plugged in, or it was just in the middle of the floor? It was just in the middle of the floor. Just what happened then? Well, at this point, is the dog with you guys now, or the dogs? Yeah, the dog like came up to us and. Um, had to run back and forth. I, I, um, you know, when we first walked in, it, it smelled really bad, and so I assumed that the dog had an accident or something. Um, and uh, so he was, you know, the dog was with us. Okay. Then what happened? Um, then we went up the stairs. No, so we, you know, peeked our head into the other room, which was it was all pretty open, and no one was in the front room. Um, so we went up the stairs, and his bedroom is as you're, on. As you're going upstairs, did you notice whether or not there was any odor? Um, just, yeah, I mean, it just was throughout the whole house. I noticed it when we first walked into the house. That's when I noticed it, and then it was always there. So. Okay, and then um, walking up the stairs, what happens? Um, so we walked up the stairs, and um, the, the way that the house is set, at the very top of the stairs to the left was his bedroom door, and it was a double door type of thing, but it was shut and it was locked. We tried to go in there, but it was locked. Did you guys knock at that door too? Uh, yeah, we knocked on the door. How did you know that was his room? Um, from the, the uh, book and film club that we had, um, the movie theater is just right there. So his bedroom's there, movie theater's there, and he had, um, when we were all there, he had shown us his room. All right. Then, uh, so now you, you're at this door, it's locked, what do you guys do? Um, the uh, boyfriend of my friend Michelle was there and he heard music and we went over to the door, well he went over to the door where there was music coming out, it was a different bedroom in the house, um, and he knocked on the door and a roommate came out. And what happened then? Um, we told him that we couldn't find Travis, we were worried, he found a key to his bedroom and um, he and the boyfriend went into the bedroom. About what time was this now? Mm, probably around 10. All right. Did you go into that bedroom when they went in or no? No, uh, Michelle and I stayed outside of the bedroom. I, um, at first they walked in and they were looking, um, so they were right in front of us and they were looking kind of this way. And right. uh, um, so at first I was, following their gaze through the crack of the door because I could see the room through the crack of the door. Um, and then as soon as they said that they saw blood, that there's blood everywhere, I stopped looking. And, um, and then they went further into the room. And did they eventually come out? Or was it a short stint inside? Or was it long? Or were um, they in there a long time? It, it didn't seem very long. They went in and then um, the roommate was, ran out and said he's dead. Um, he's dead, and so I, immediately I called the police and ran downstairs and out the front door so that I could get the address of the house. All right. Um, after this, was there some sort of service for Mr. Alexander here in the Mesa area? Yeah, just a few days later there was a memorial service for him. Do you remember what day of the week it was? It, it, I don't remember exactly. It would have been a Thursday, I, I would assume, because this was a Monday night. So right. Wednesday, Thursday. When, when I asked about the memorial service, was the body there or not? At the no. memorial service? No. No? It was just a, just a memorial service then? Yeah. And um, where was the this uh, service held? Um, this was at the church building where we um, went to church every Sunday. In Mesa, it was, it's off, um, uh, off Guadalupe and the 202 area. And while you were there, well, when did it start? What time? I don't remember exactly. In the evening, seven, six, seven o'clock. And were there a lot of people there? Just give a yes or no. Yes, there were a lot of people. And of all the people that were there, was there somebody by the name of Jody Arias? Yes. 
And is the person that you knew as Judy Arias, is she in court today? Yes. Tell me where she is seated and what she is wearing. Um, she's seated over there at the end of the table. And I can't see her clearly, but she's wearing black and she has dark hair. Is she at the extreme end? Yes. Um, Your Honor, may the record reflect the identification of the defendant? Yes. So you see the defendant there, and do you go up to her or does she go up to you? She came up to me and introduced herself to me. What did she say? She said, are you Mimi Hall? I go by Mimi. That's All right. And I said yes. Um, and she and she introduced herself as Jody Ayers. And did she say anything else? Um, I asked her how she was doing, and she said she was upset. And so that was about it. So. Anytime, did at any time she say, I'm the person who killed him or anything like that? No. Did she ever tell you why she was there? No. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. I want to begin, if I heard correctly, when you were talking to counsel for the state, you advised him you were 33 years old, right? Yes. Okay. And if I also heard you correctly, uh, you said you were, I believe the phrase you used was born into the church. That's correct. Okay. And um, that's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and you went to Brigham Young University. Yes. And that is a institution supported by that church. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. What I wanted to do to begin with is just talk to you a little bit about um, the state asked you a little bit about the structure of the church, the repentance process, everything of that nature. I kind of want to talk a little bit about that first of all. Okay. 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 Um, you mentioned to us that there were various wars that the church has broken down to. Is that correct? Various wards. Is that wards? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. The mic correct. is low yeah. and I'm tall. So if, if you have trouble hearing me, please let me know. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And you said that those are uh, geographical boundaries that determine oh, a particular ward, right? Yes. Okay. And I believe what you also told us was that you weren't aware of, of how those boundaries were drawn. Not exactly. I just know that it's for convenience sake, you know, they try to get, you know, the boundaries done so that you can get to a ward that's close by to you. Okay. And do you know if any ward boundaries overlap at all? Do you have any knowledge of that? Um, sometimes, yeah, I've heard of that. Okay. Yeah. And um, are there, does each ward contain one church or do sometimes wards contain more than one church? Do you mean like a building, a ward building? Yeah, or, a church of services where... Yeah, so um, we have church buildings and usually you will have up to three, maybe um, maybe, maybe five wards will meet there every Sunday. And I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, so yes, in each church building, um, several wards will meet um, there every Sunday. So they'll, they, they're divided into three-hour service blocks. Okay. And so, you know, some a ward will start at 8 o'clock and go to 11. Another ward will come in from 11.30 to, you know, and so on okay. so, and throughout the day. I see. Okay. <laughs> and when you talk about uh, your wards, where you talked about single and family ward, and I, I believe you told us that, the year where you cross over to that is 31 years old from you moved to a single to a family? Yes, that's right. Okay. And so the wards aren't necessarily tied to a particular church. They're just tied to that particular area. Is that correct? Um, the single, I, don't, I guess I don't understand your question. Okay. And, and maybe, maybe I didn't phrase it very well. But the, the, uh, the wards aren't tied to maybe one particular church within that ward. It could be, it's a bigger area, I guess is my point. Um, the, the, the ward building, yeah, so is, you know, you'll have different, so the ward building isn't tied to one single uh, ward boundary. Okay. So you'll have different wards within a geographical area. And the, so you'll have maybe 
uh, I don't know, you'll have several wards within what we call a stake. And okay. so, so that's how the, the church is kind of set up. So it, you have an individual ward, but throughout the entire church, you know, you're, you have stakes and then you have regions and then you have, um, you know, different countries. And so all the way through the whole church. And did you say just, just so I want to make, did you say stakes or states? Stakes. Okay. Like S T A K. And that is a stake in your church is more than one ward. Right. It's a group of collection of wards. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, when you started talking with Mr. Martinez about, uh, he asked you about the repentance process and excommunication. Do you recall that discussion? Yes. Okay. Um, let, let me ask you that. Let me begin by asking you this, because we've talked a little bit about wards. Is there one particular person that's in charge of a ward or is there several? Um, so you have a bishop who's who's basically in charge of the spiritual, temporal well-being of a ward of a congregation. OK. Um, and then, like I said earlier, you have several wards within a stake. Then you have a stake president who's um, kind of over all of the wards who, you know, make sure that the bishops are able to meet the needs of the individual ward members. And there are other callings within the church. So you have a relief society, um, which is an organization for sisters in the in the wards, okay. uh, and so on. So they just it's just set up so that people's needs are being met spiritually and temporally. And okay. we have a bishop and a state president. All right. Thank you. Now, if I understood you correctly as well, uh, if one of, and I don't even know, members of the ward, that'd be the correct term? Or is yes. No, okay. Yeah. One of the members of the ward were to do something that was sanctionable or a sin or whatever word you want to put on it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and forgive me if I'm using the wrong word, the punishment uh, would be decided upon by that bishop. Is that correct? Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, it depends on, you know, the sin, what exactly happened. Sometimes they go to a, um, so like the bishop will determine if they need to meet with a disciplinary council, which might be held uh, of, like it might be the bishop and his counselors, or it might be even the state president, their counselors, things like that. But, um, but yes, the individual and the bishop um, meet together and decide, you know, they kind of work together through the repentance process. He's someone who's um, very loving and open and helpful and, you know, there to help out, so. Okay. Um, so you say loving and helpful is not, in your mind anyway, a, um, an act of condemnation that the bishop would, would put upon a person who's, who said that they sin? No, um, the, you know, the, the, the judging, you know, um, they kind of, act, they kind of act as far as like what needs to be done. They help, um, determine you know, what the repentance process steps would be, but the ultimately the judging is between, you know, God and the individual and their own repentance, you know, they, and where their heart is and what they um, do. I've never, I don't know, uh, you know, the exact intricate details of it. I haven't had okay. to go into that. Um, and I haven't really talked to anybody who has gone through that. Okay. So about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> If I understand you correctly, then um, the way you phrased it, that that ultimately uh, in your church, God would be the ultimate judge of, of the sin. But the bishop would um, detail out a repentance process. Yeah. OK. All right. Now, and, and you may have already alluded to you, you kind of mentioned you didn't know the intricate details of this, but if. If someone in the church had sinned and, and another member knew about it, would they be obligated to tell the bishop? How would that how would that work? Um, if it were um, something that were, uh, you know, putting someone um, in danger, you know, if it if like let's say it was abuse or something, um, yeah, I would feel like you that person would be obligated to tell somebody 
what was happening. But um, it's it's if you know it's up to the individual to go in and talk to the bishop. Um, if it's blatant and open, usually the bishop will probably call them in and okay. ask to talk to them. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's between the individual and it's up to them. You know where it, when they feel like they need to repent to go and make an appointment with their bishop. Okay. So if someone is sinning and nobody else knows about it, um, they're probably, the bishop wouldn't necessarily have a mechanism to find out unless that person chose, the, the person who was committing the sin chose to go address it with their bishop. Is that is that what you're telling me? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Well, probably not. <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> Uh, it would be the obligation, really, because there's no there's no mechanism in place. For example, you said, well, if somebody's safety was in jeopardy, you might feel, feel compelled to talk to your bishop, right? Yeah, or an authority okay. figure. Yeah, like a right. police officer or something. But I guess what I'm saying, and it sounds to me like in your church, if somebody was sinning, uh, it would be incumbent upon them to they would be expected perhaps to go talk to the bishop. That yeah. They're the ones that are supposed to deal with that, not yeah. anyone else. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what true repentance is, is if someone feels bad about what they're doing and they want to stop, they will make that call. They'll, you know, get on their knees, repent, go and talk to the bishop and go start the repentance process. Okay. They can't just say, oh, I'm sorry. I won't do this again. You know, if it's a serious sin, they can't just say, right. okay, I'm never going to do this again. I'm fine. You know, um, and then tomorrow I'll do it again. You know, it's, that's not truly repenting, if that makes sense. You, repenting yeah. is changing your ways. Okay. So. Let me ask you, because you've talked about, you just mentioned the seriousness of a sin. Mm -hmm. um, how serious within the, the scope of your church or the dictates of your church is the, the sin of premarital sex? It's very serious. Um, like I said before, you can be excommunicated for it. Um, I mean, so you have... Well, let me ask you this way. Is there, is there a list? Is there a hierarchy? Or is it just very serious? Okay, well, I, there's, there's a scripture so that, you know, that teaches that the most, um, the most severe sin would be to to deny the Holy Ghost and to commit murder. Okay. Next in line would be fornication, adultery, sexual immorality. Okay. And that's so very serious. So number two or three on the list. Number it's, three on the list. Yeah. You told so. us, right? Okay. That makes that makes sense. So it's really high up there. It's a yes. big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. And like you said, that could lead to excommunication if someone found out. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me kind of uh, step back a bit, and, and I want to ask you about a few phrases or, or things uh, prominent in your church. Could you describe for us what the term temple worthy means? Um, someone who holds a temple recommend, so that means they've gone to their bishop and gone through an interview, and also to the stake president and had an interview with them. And there's a series of questions, which questions are just to want to find out if they're obeying the commandments of God. So, you know, and and, you know, are active members in the church. So they show up to church on Sunday. They partake of the sacrament. They um, are repenting when they, you know, make mistakes. Um, they are serving in their calling. So it's, it's just to see their level, basically, of commitment to the Lord in their church service and worship. Okay. Um, to your knowledge, was Travis Alexander temple worthy for your I, church? I didn't know whether okay. or not he was. Okay. Let me ask you about the term priesthood holder. What does that mean in your church? Um, so the priesthood holder is basically, um, so at the age of 12, uh, a young boy receives the priesthood. So, and there's different levels of priesthood um, power and keys. Um, but it's, it's essentially somebody that holds the power to give blessings. Um, it's power ordained to them through God. Okay. Um, and so, um, so in order to have that, it, you know, you have to make sure you are maintaining a worthy, clean, pure lifestyle. 
Um, and it's, it's essentially, it's a way to serve people in the church by giving blessings, uh, of healing, of comfort, um, and so on. And, and they also bless the uh, sacrament with it. And they use that also in the temple. Okay. Um, and, and you said boys are, do women become priesthood holders in your church? No. no. Okay. And um, to your knowledge, uh, was Mr. Alexander a priesthood holder? Um, I, I thought he was. So, yeah, I don't know for sure, though. I, I thought he was. Okay. And what do you base that knowledge on? Um, the fact that he was going to church. Um, I hadn't ever heard he had been excommunicated. When you're excommunicated, if you're a man, you lose your priesthood power. Um, okay. And so, uh, so I assumed, um, since he was an active member of the church, he was also a worthy priesthood holder. Okay. And it sounds to me like you would assume that because no one knew or no one knew of him committing any of the sins that would that lead to any sanctions, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. And based on what you said before, uh, it sounds to me like if someone committed one of those, uh, again, the, the sin of premarital sex, they would lose their temple worthy status and their status as a priesthood holder. Is that right? Right. Okay. Typically, yeah. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you now a little bit about uh, Mr. Alexander himself and, and your relationship with him, okay? Okay. Uh, in a moment, Judge. Exhibit 254, just for the record. In this hall, as I hand you that, do you recall some time ago, and I certainly couldn't recall the exact date, that you and I sat down and had a conversation about your relationship with Mr. Alexander? Um, I don't remember the exact date, but yes, you and Mr. Martinez were there. Okay. I just wanted to just talk to you about some of those things, and, and if you have trouble kind of remembering some of the things you said, I, I've put that exhibit there just to so you could refresh your recollection if need be, okay? Okay, do we, um, so this is a transcript of the uh, yes, recording that you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, one of the things you told us that day was that you said you knew Travis for about a year at the time before his death. Is that about right? I knew who he was when it, okay. I, I moved into the ward in about July or August, I would think. And so the first Sunday I went there, he gave a talk in church. Okay. So I knew who he was, but we didn't officially meet until later. Okay. And do you remember how old you were when you moved into the ward? Um, that would have been... A, almost five years, five and a half years ago, I guess. Uh, okay. So 27, 28. Okay. All right. And um, one of the things uh, I believe you told us then and what you told Mr. Martinez this afternoon was that, uh, and ma'am, I'll just ask you questions. If you need to refer back, go ahead and let okay. me know, okay? Uh, that you two, you and Mr. Alexander began dating in February 2008, correct? Um, that would... And that was an approximate time. Yeah. I'm not holding to you a specific yeah. date. Okay. And those dates in February 2008, those were the dates that you described to Mr. Martinez a few moments ago. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. They were an approximation. What's that? Yes, they were an approximation. Okay. All right. Um... And it sounded to me, and I, it got a little confusing, and I understand time frames aren't going to be exact this many years ago, but it sounded to me like after those dates, you, be, you began dating someone else, correct? Yeah, so it would have been um, after the first date, 
from what I remember. Okay. We, I then began dating someone else. And so, again, time, the exact time, I don't remember other than, uh, you know, guesstimating. Okay, so. right, and, 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 that's, and that's fair. So we're talking February, March-ish of 2008 when, the, when this was occurring. Yes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, if, I, if I understand you, understood you correctly, after that first date with Mr. Alexander, you didn't have any romantic interest, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and after this period of time, you went on this date, you then began dating another individual for a few weeks, I think. Is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Mr. Alexander had asked you out in a period of time when you were dating this under other individual. Is that accurate? He, yeah, he, I, I believe I remember that he tried asking me out and I let him know that I was dating someone else. Okay. When that period of dating ended with this other individual, not with Travis, but this other individual, mm -hmm. um, it sounds to me like you went on other dates with Travis. Is that correct? Yes, I remember going on two more dates with him afterward. So. Okay. And was that the rock climbing wall that you were talking to Mr. Martinez about, or was yeah. that something else? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and when, if you could tell us perhaps in relation, and the, the last date you went on with Mr. Alexander was to the rock climbing wall, is that right? Is that the last one? Yeah. Okay. Um, with that, I'm, and I'm not holding you to a specific date here, but was there, do you remember how longer, how much time elapsed before, between that last date and his asking you to go to Cancun? Not exactly. I don't remember the exact time. Two weeks, three but, weeks? Um, I, would, I would think it would have been um, in March, maybe April, the beginning of April okay. when we went rock climbing. And then he asked me to go with him in Cancun, I believe sometime in May, the beginning of May. Okay. So, so again, I don't remember the exact day okay. when that happened. But In between your uh, date at the rock climbing wall. Mm -hmm and your trip to Cancun, or your, him asking you to go to Cancun, excuse me. Okay. Um, did he ask you out other times? Um, yeah, I had let him know that we would just be friends, that I, I, I wasn't interested in going out with him anymore. Okay. So that I just wanted to be friends. So he might have asked me out one other time and I let him know, you know, that no, we're, I don't really have any interest, you know, I just want to be friends. Okay. So. And this was after the rock climbing wall that you kind of gave him the friends talk, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then it was sometime after you told him you just wanted to be friends that he asked you to go to Cancun, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, and I remember you told Mr. Martinez that you didn't say yes right away. You thought about it for a few days, right? Yeah, I remember thinking about it and um, asking my mom, you know, if it was a good idea. Um, and coming to the conclusion that, you know, since he wasn't paying for any of it, that it was a place that I'd been to with my own family and felt very comfortable um, with this place. I knew how fun it was. Uh, and the fact that we were going with a family and we were staying in totally separate rooms, I felt very comfortable going with my friend. To okay. <laughs> Did you, and I get the sense from the, the fact that you didn't accept right away that you might have um, been surprised by his... Uh, asking you to go to, I mean, it's a difference to go to, to a rock climbing wall uh, in town to go to Cancun, right? I mean, was that a bit of a surprise to you? Well, at that point, we were, you know, closer friends at that point. You okay. know, we, so uh, giving him the friend talk, I, I was always very upfront, direct with Travis. Um, he knew that we were just friends. Um, I'm, he's a persistent guy, and I think part of him still hoped maybe that um, I would end up liking him. So um, I, I initially thought that that's why, because uh, he was trying to get me to like him, you know, to go with him to Cancun. Um, but, um, you know, again, I gave him the, you know, we're just friends, you know, just tried to make sure, sure everything was um, on the same level, like he understood where I was at, and he did, and he was really respectful of that, and 
what? still wanted me to go with him to Cancun. And so just, and I think you said it, but this is prior to going to Cancun, you kind of reinitiated your uh, statements or your feelings that you just wanted to be friends. You wanted mm -hmm. to clarify with him just to make sure. Yeah, and even um, a few weeks before, like, uh, before we went, uh, again, I told him, Travis, maybe you should take somebody else um, to Cancun with you. And there wasn't anyone else that he wanted to take. So. Okay. Wasn't anyone else he wanted to take? I'm just wondering, did, did the time you were seeing him and, and going on these dates or anything else, uh, did he tell you he was also dating Jody Arias? No, I had no idea. Okay. Uh, did he tell you that he was having sexual relations with Jody Arias? No. Okay. Uh, what he did, it seemed seemingly told you, and I'm not going to ask exactly what he said, but it was during a, a camping trip, if, if I recall correctly, that... Uh, he told you he had a stalker. It was in this camping trip in Prescott. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He didn't um, say a name at all, but he, when we were camping, we were having breakfast with a couple of friends around, and uh, he told me that at that point that he had a stalker and that she had actually followed us on a date and that she knew who I was. And I told him that that was really scary and that he should get a restraining order. Okay. Um, and you say that uh, he didn't tell you, he didn't say that this was Jody, right? No, he okay. didn't say who it was. Could I uh, draw your attention, if you'd be so kind, uh, as to look at uh, page six of the transcript and just um, read uh, to yourself for a moment? Can, uh, and just read to your no quietly. I'm sorry. Okay. W um, w where? On page? Um, page six. Begin. You should begin around line six or seven. This is um. Hey, no, ma'am. I didn't ask a question. Oh. If I could approach your honor. Okay. I want to make sure I have the exact spot. I just turned page six. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this. You, you and, I, and I kind of interrupted you. You said you gave him the advice that uh, this, he should seek a restraining order against this stalker, right? Yeah. Okay. And you expressed to him that you were scared of this stalker, right? I'm scared of any stalker. Okay. It's, a, it's not something you want to take lightly. Okay. And to your knowledge, did he ever seek out a restraining order? Not that I know of, no. Okay. He, he told me not to be afraid. Okay. And your testimony is he never said to you that Jody Arias was his stalker. That's your testimony? That's from what I can remember. I don't remember him ever saying. I, the, the time I remember hearing the name Jody, and it, it could have been then, but the time I actually recall the name Jody was the night that we found him at his oh. house. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Nothing further, Your Honor. Redirect. Before well, I talk to you a little bit more about this stalker issue and what it was that he told you um, when you were up in what, Prescott? That one? Uh, I think it was in Payson. Payson? Yeah. Uh, you indicated that part of what he told you was that this, this stalker was a female, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what had this female done that he was warning you about? She had. She actually beyond the scope of cross. Overruled. She had slashed his tires several times. She had slashed his, he had dated someone earlier that year. He, she had slashed her tires. She had sent threatening emails to both um, Travis and the, the, his girlfriend of the time. Um, she had followed us on the first date that we went on. Um, she sounded dangerous. She had broken into his email accounts, his bank accounts. She would sneak into his house through the doggy door 
and sleep on his couch at night without him knowing that she was there. So. And you were dating him uh, what month of what year? We went out. Um, Sorry, you went out what yeah. month of what year? Uh, like I like I'm said January or February that that first time, and then right. later on in March ish. So it could have been from January to March of 2008 that these dates took place. Then yes. Mm -hmm. In terms of whether or not Mr. Alexander was temple worthy, do you know whether or not he was temple worthy? I don't know. I what, knew he was in the past because he talked about going to the temple, but. You know, when we were hanging out, I didn't know whether he was or not. And in terms of whether or not he was a priesthood holder, you assume that he was, but you don't really know, right? Yeah, actually, I'd like to go back. I, um, I think he had told, I remember just now when you asked me that, that I think he had told me that he um, wasn't worthy to go to the temple. Was or was not? Was not. A what? Worthy to go to the temple. Um, but as far as the priesthood holder, so me, hold on. Okay. The microphones are not so good here. Okay. The system is. Was he or was he not temple worthy? You're going to tell us about that, and then the priesthood holder. Why don't you tell us about those? So, um, I I actually remember him talking about, um, you know, he used to work in the temple, and then I remembered him telling me a story uh, that he was no longer. Uh, Worthy to go to the temple. He didn't tell me why. Um, I didn't ask why. That's private. Um, and he's and not temple worthy. Then. So yeah. So I must. So during that time, I don't think he was temple worthy. Um, and then priesthood holder. I assumed um, that he was at that time, but I don't know. All right. And you were talking about the gradation, or what is the most serious of all sins, and murders at the top is one of them, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. along with denying the Holy Ghost, right? Right. And then underneath that, you listed some others. What were those? Um, sexual immorality, so that would be fornication, adultery. Well, just so that we're getting get this clear, adultery, what does that refer to? When um, a husband and wife, you know, if you have a marriage, you have a husband and wife, and one of them sleeps with or has a sexual relationship with someone outside of their marriage. All right. How is that different from fornication? Fornication, as far as I understand, is for, with a single uh, person. So somebody who's not married and has a sexual relationship with someone else who is not married. So it's the same thing, only it's, a, it's yeah. sort of a, if you will, a, a, a one's married classification? One's married. Right. Um, and in terms of the sinfulness of the person, does it matter that the person who is engaging in fornication is a woman? In other words, is it lesser for a woman to engage in fornication than it is for a guy? No. So there, it's the same sort of sin, right? Yes. Let me ask you the situation you were asked about, reporting and that sort of thing. What if a person is engaging in fornication, whether they be, let's just say it's female, and that person does not self-report. Is that in and itself a sin? Can you say that again? I'm sorry. How about if a person is having sex with somebody and they're single? Mm -hmm. That's a yes, correct? Yes. And this person continually has sex, but does not self-report, doesn't go to the bishop and say, I'm having sex and I'm not married. Is that also a sin, the failure to report? It's, it's, it's just not repenting of that sin. You're, right. you're, you're continuing on with the sin, yeah. So. In this gradation of sins that we've, ta we've talked about, the murder and the denial of the Holy Ghost, and then you told us where fornication and adultery came in. How about lying? Is that a sin? Objection to the honest old crowd. Not repentant. Overall. It's a, sin. a sin? it's a sin to lie. And that's part of this list that you were talking to the defense attorney about? Yeah. Um, in terms of this uh, issue involving whether or not if somebody's being hurt and reporting it, is the only recourse if somebody's being hurt to report it to the bishop, or is there a different recourse? Can a person report it to somebody else? For example, law enforcement. <coughs> 
you you can tell anybody you want to what your right. sin. Yes, but to, in order to become clean again, and you know, you have to tell your bishop. You have to confess the sin. And this trip to Cancun that you talked to the defense attorney about, uh, you at first told him you didn't want to go, right? I, I told him that I wanted to think about it, told him that I would go. Then a couple of weeks beforehand, I told him he should take someone else. A couple of weeks beforehand, you told me he should take somebody else a couple of weeks before the trip, right? Correct. And did he agree to take somebody else? He's, he did not. He, there wasn't anyone else he wanted to take. And these conversations took place at what month and what year? May 2008. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Does any member of the jury have a question for this witness? I see no hands. Thank you. You may step down. Counsel, please approach. Can you spell your first and last name, please? S-T-E-R-L-I-N-G. W-I-L-L-I-N-G. Okay. Raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you, God? I do. Thank you. You may. Your name, sir? Sterling Williams. And who do you work for? Mesa Police. What do you do for? I'm a patrol officer. How long have you been with the city of Mesa Police Department? Approximately six years. And what is it that uh, you do as a patrol officer? <laughs> Respond to calls for service as put in by the public, patrol neighborhoods in my assigned area. Do you ride with one person or do you go by yourself? It varies. I generally ride by myself, though. Did you have occasion to be on duty back on uh, June 9th of 2008? Yes, sir. And uh, did you have the occasion to be on duty sometime after 9.30 p.m.? Yes, sir. Did you have occasion to respond to an address on Queensboro? Yes. What was that address? 11428 East Queensboro Avenue. And is that in Mesa, Maricopa County, Arizona? Yes. And that residence, describe it for me. Is that an apartment? Is it a trailer? Is it a house? What is it? It's a house. It's a good occupancy. What time did you respond there? I got dispatched at 10.30 p.m. I arrived on scene at 10.36 p.m. And did you speak to anybody when you got there? Not initially. Uh, what did you do when you got there? I arrived shortly after fire personnel. They had already been directed to the upstairs master bedroom. So I proceeded to follow them inside. And when you followed them inside, are you talking about the bathroom? In, inside of the residence through the front door. Did you go, where did you go once you were inside? Once we went inside, we went directly to the stairs, took the stairs up to the top and there's a set of double doors at the top of the stairs to the left which was the entrance to the master bedroom suite. And we went in through the open door in there and fire personnel went in to find the body. And um, did you actually see the fire department work on the vicinity too or not? They didn't work on him, no. They looked at him and what They happened? visually inspected him and were able to declare him deceased at that point. What were you able to see? As far as the body? Yes, sir. It appeared to me that he'd been deceased and in that position for quite some time. Anything unusual about the body that called your attention to it? Uh, other than the neck wound, he had a, appeared to be bl dried blood on his neck, appeared to be a neck wound from ear to ear. His face was dark purple, almost black. The rest of his body was a very pale white, and he was kind of crammed in the bottom of a shower stall. Anything unusual about one of the cuts? Anything that caught yeah, your the, attention? The cut on the throat was, uh, it had dried blood around the outside edges. It was still moist on the inside. And at the top portion where the wound was up near his ear, uh, the way he was crouched down, it appeared there was gas escaping the body. Every few seconds there, it would bubble. And was the bubble red in color? No, reddish, but not entirely. Okay. I'm going to show you photographs. Please take a look at exhibits numbers 73, 74, and 75. Please take a look at them and see if you recognize what's there.
Yes. Where are they? This is the body that I found in the shower. Is it in the, these photographs, true and accurate depictions of the body as it existed back on June 9th of 2008 when you found the body? Yes. Move for the admission of exhibits 73 through 79. <coughs> Any objection? Moment, Your Honor. Oh, Exhibit 73, 74, and 75 are admitted. What are we looking at here? That's the shower stall with the body crammed down on the bottom of it in the master bedroom. Okay. And exhibit number 74, it's what are a, we looking at there? It's closer up above shot of the body, same body. And exhibit number 75. It's a close-up shot of the neck wound that I saw. That was... you, were, you indicated something about gases and, and items coming out. Does this show that area? Yes. Where? Right at the end of the wound near the ear, where you can see the small specks of blood and substance. It was bubbling and splattering as it would bubble. Other than that area that we just saw, the neck area, did you see any other areas that had blood on it? Just his chest. I didn't examine the body very much after that. Did you have occasion to look elsewhere, or was that the extent of what you looked at? I did look briefly around the remainder of the bathroom while I was in there, yes. And what is it that you saw in the bathroom? I noticed large amounts of blood spatter in the sink and on the countertop. I also noticed some, uh, there was a linen closet directly across from the walk-in closet. The door was closed and it looked like there was some dried blood possibly under the door. Yeah, but this, is this covered by linoleum or is this carpeted? This was a tile area. The tile area. So was it the carpet of the closet? No. No. How did you actually walk in there? Did you walk in? As I entered the room, I noticed large amounts of blood on the carpet, the transition between the tile and the carpet from the master bedroom. So that, that would be there was a, an immediate right? right? Yes. There was a hallway leading off to the bathroom where the shower stall was. That was all covered in blood. I, I noticed large amounts of blood pooling and, and smears. Uh, there was a walk-in closet that paralleled that hallway with doors on both ends. That closet was clean. There was It was actually immaculately clean. There was the nothing in there. In the closet. Is that, was there any blood in that car? No. And that's the one that's directly next to the, the shower area then? Yes. And so did you notice any blood in that, area, in that closet? No, I did not. When you said it was immaculately clean, what do you mean? Everything was very neatly in order. All the shoes were well placed. Clothes were hung up nicely. It just appeared very clean. Did you take a look at the bedroom area? Yes. And did you see any blood there? Uh, yes, I'm right at the entryway to the hallway leading to the bathroom. So that's the, again, sort of that border between the hallway and the carpet? Yes. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. We have no questions for Officer Williams. Does any member of the jury have a question for this witness? I see no hands. You may step down. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take the evening recess at this time. Please be back in the designated area at 1030 a.m. tomorrow morning. Please remember the admonition. Are there any questions? Thank you. Have a nice evening. You are excused. <laughs>